So our final panel of the day is we're going to be looking at Brazil's changing political landscape and how that might impact the new administration's ability to respond to some of the challenges that you've heard about this morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. We have Professor David Fleischer, Professor Emeritus with the University of Brasilia, Chris Garman, Managing Director for the Americas at the Eurasia Group, and our own Paulo Sotero, Director of the Brazil Institute. Paulo, did you want to get us started? Yeah, just to you know, put this in context, uh, what is the, the latest in Brazil? Uh, there is a major, uh, or if there is hope uh, from, uh, after all, we have a newly elected president. The problem of legitimacy in government has been resolved. There was a problem of legitimacy following the impeachment of uh, uh, President uh, Dilma Rousseff, uh, although her successor was the legitimate <laughs> elected vice president of Brazil, uh, his performance uh, ended up costing support and raising questions about the legitimacy, which was a point that her party, the Workers' Party, highlighted very much. Now, this problem is over. Brazil has uh, constitutionally, not the other was also constitutionally elected, That's but true, yeah. was uh, was a painful process. Was uh, the second impeachment of a president in Brazil in three decades, in less than three decades. So, it is uh, we are in a new uh, plateau, uh, more stable. Let me t tell you a couple of things that I wanted to just to some some parameters. You may have read a lot in the American press and the European press about the threat to democracy in Brazil, that the military in are coming back and things of the sort. Uh, I uh, do not share that type of anxiety. Uh, I think uh, Brazilian democracy is obviously, has been under stress, but uh, it continues to function and uh, uh, it's now up to a new leader who has already held the Constitution in his hands on a couple of occasions saying that this is the guy, this is what it's I'm going Bible. to reserve, this is the Bible, this is so. Uh, that is a source of reassurance uh, because uh, some of the issues that uh, his, uh, himself and others have contested that uh, express very contrarian opinions, they are uh, matters in, they are there in the Constitution, certain rights, uh, certain values that are consecrated in that Constitution. There will be obviously lots of discussions. The other part that I'm curious about and reading the media and listening to people's statesmen, uh, you have uh, to ask, uh, what is the depth of the new government commitment to the liberal economic liberalization policies that have been announced by the chief economic advisor and future minister of the economy in Brazil, Paulo Guedes? Uh, and what is, and maybe more importantly, what is the capacity of the new team to make that happen through the legislative process, through the political process. Uh, it's much easier said than done, uh, but, uh, well, uh, the president was elected in a clear message of change, of rejection of what came last, which was more interventionist types of policies uh, led by the Workers' Party for about, what, 15 years? Uh, you have a different scenario now. Another question related to what I just said, uh, and I hope that David and Chris would be able to enlighten us on that, uh, in terms of the new Congress. Uh, the new president, the, the uh, president-elect, has spent 28 years almost in Congress. He knows Congress. Uh, he is not sort of uh, uh, a 
person from outside of the system. He's very much an insider. Uh, but we don't know much about the groups, the new faces that are entering Brazilian politics. Uh, we know some of them, but we don't know what uh, uh, that group will bring, particularly in terms of the reforms that Brazil desperately needs, as illustrated by the first panel when our friends from the IMF, uh, you know, the, it's an economy that if you look uh, to the, the lines there in some of those graphs, to to paraphrase something that Mauricio Mesquita Moreira from the IDB said here recently, it looks like, the Brazilian economy looks like an EKG of a dead person. <laughs> it doesn't, it's there, it doesn't, it's flat, it doesn't move. <laughs> Uh, it's a it's a huge task. It's a huge ta a, a, a huge task. Uh, does the country has what it takes to move it to reinvent itself? Yes, in Brazil has proved that in the past. It does have that, but uh, governing is a complicated uh, affair. The cur the group, in the incoming group, especially the president and his chief minister, uh, are have little experience in working under the hood of the <laughs> state machinery. So uh, obviously we have to, to wish that they will uh, surround themselves with very able people. Someone just told me that, uh, uh, I think Carlos just told me that uh, uh, the nomination of uh, Joaquin Levy as uh, president of BNDS has been announced and confirmed. It's very good news, I think, for Brazil. It's very good news uh, for me because uh, Joaquin is a dear, dear friend. When he was nominated uh, Minister of Finance under Dilma, uh, one year, one year. Yeah, he came to the Wilson. The first place where he spoke about his plans was as kind of a, uh, a, a background uh, meeting with Off a group of people. Yeah, it was a, yes, it was a, a, I w I a chat, a Chatham Rules uh, meeting. And uh, and what's good about this is that I, I talked to Joaquin for about one hour uh, last Saturday. <laughs> and he was absolutely, you know, uh, quiet about that. Mm -hmm. And that uh, which is good. Uh, there is discipline and th it looks like there is discipline in the way they announce things, etc. It's, it's a positive. Uh, but there is this, uh, 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 there are those doubts about uh, maybe uh, commitment and capacity to turn commitment to, into action. Uh, and the second thing I think we, there could be quite uh, 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 a turnaround in terms of Brazil-U.S. relations. Uh, I think the two presidents are, are uh, more or less. No, they're, they're, they are, they are, po they are populists. They are, they use social media to communicate to p people. So the uh, people in the bureaucracies in Brazil must be very apprehensive about that because it looks like they could focus more on results than on process. M the Brazil-U.S. economy, uh, Brazil-U.S. relations could benefit from that, uh, and it could benefit quite soon. Uh, there is one deal that is basically negotiated. It takes leadership. It takes a sense of direction from, especially in this case, from Brazil, to make things like uh, a partnership between Embraer and Boeing to become reality, work, yeah. and uh, uh, because the preparatory work has been mostly done. Mm -hmm. So in that hopeful note, uh, we I would like to offer the floor to my colleagues here. Who goes first? David? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, it's good to be back here at the Wilson Center, and I thank Paulo and everyone here at the Brazil Institute for setting up this very, very interesting three-panel uh, event today, and so I thank you all very much. Uh,
as Paulo described, can I, let me, it's better if I have this microphone, as others have done. As Paulo described, we had a big game changer election. Well, what really happened? We had two big waves of public opinion. Number one, a wave of public opinion that you would say would be anti-Lula and anti-PT, and an alienation or disgust with our corrupt political system. Voters were saying, all politicians are corrupt. I won't vote to reelect anyone. I'm going to search for a new, clean face. Well, Bolsonaro was able to incorporate both of these currents of opinion into his campaign as, in quotes, the anti-system candidate. Since 94, presidential elections in Brazil were polarized between the PT and the PSDB. But in 2018, the PSDB and the center literally disappeared. Alchemy PSDB, Mardina Silva, et cetera, did not advance in the polls. So there was a left-right polarization between the PT, the Workers' Party, versus Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro used digital campaign, his, uh, had a, use, a digital campaign very effectively, social networks and social media. However, he does not use Twitter. That's, that's what Trump uses, he tweets everything. Or just a quick sequence of events uh, this year. In January, Judge Sergio Moro convicted Lula. And in April, uh, the, the regional court in Porto Alegre con maintained Lula's conviction, and he was finally arrested and impris imprisoned on the 7th of April, and has been in jail in Curitiba ever since. In August, Lula stubbornly maintained his candidacy, and the PT was forced to officially register his candidacy, with Fernanda Daji as his vice president candidate running mate. On the 6th of September, Bolsonaro suffered a very vicious knife attack in Juiz de Fora uh, and nearly died, but was saved by the doctors at the hospital in Juiz de Fora. That meant no more street campaigning for, for Bolsonaro and no participation in any TV debates. On the 9th of September, the TSE finally rejected Lula's candidacy. So I ask you a question. Where in the world was a prisoner ever a presidential candidate in a presidential system? Does anyone know that answer? It was almost 100 years ago. Here in the, U here in the U.S. in 1920, Eugene Debs, who was leader of the Socialist Party, was a candidate for the presidency, but was in jail. Why was he in jail? Sedition. He was against World War I and against the U.S. participation in World War I. That got him in jail. Finally, Warren Harding, the next president, pardoned him. I think it was in in 1921 or 22. So there was this precedent of uh, Eugene Debs, but almost 100 years ago. On September 11th, the PT finally launched Adagi as president, presidential candidate, with Maria Manuela Davila from the PC to be as, as vice president. Adagi then had less than 30 days to campaign before the first round. First and second round election results. Bolsonaro picked up 46% on the first round of valid votes, and Adagi 29.6. On the second round, Bolsonaro won with 55% of the valid vote, and Adagi with nearly 45%. So the valid vote spread was, on the first round, 16.8 points, and the second round, 10.2. So now the anti-system candidate will have to govern within the system. The election was quite regionalized. This be this was touched on briefly in the, the, the presentation about regionalization in Brazil. Adagi won in 11 states, all of the northeast nine states. That's where Bolsa Família is the strongest and was created by Lula in 2003. Plus Tocantins and Pará. Bolsonaro, PSL, won in 16 states, all the south, the southeast, central west, and part of the north. Perhaps 21 parties will be in the chamber of deputies, perhaps, and 15 parties in the Senate. We're gonna have some parties be dro dropping out because they didn't surpass what we call the performance barrier in this election. So what about Bolsonaro's political support in Congress? It should be fairly broad uh, because he would need 60% of both houses to do any, pass any constitutional amendments. Bolsonaro had very strong coattails. Coattails is an expression used here in the US his, his party had eight deputies and then increased to 52 with four senators. And four governors were elected and many what we would call governors as joiners. 
tomorrow he's going to receive 18 governors for a visit in, 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 in Brasilia. There was considerable turnover in the Congress as well. The Senate had 54 seats up for election, two per state. 32 senators ran for re-election, but only 10 were re-elected. So we had 44 newcomers, almost 82% turnover. Uh, many of the traditional parties were reduced. MDB, as you can see, got reduced in the Senate, PSDB, the PT, and also the PR. Other parties increased. The PSD increased a little bit in the Hedgie as well. And 12 senators might migrate to other larger parties. Many prominent senators were defeated, not names that you may have seen before. Omer Juca, Inés de Oliveira, the current Senate president, was defeated. Roberto Hequion from Paraná, our own Cristóvão Buarque in Brasilia, Magno Malta and Ricardo Ferraso from Espírito Santo, Lindbergh Ferreira, PT in Rio, Edson Lobon, the whole Sarney family was wiped out in Maranhão. Didn't, no one got elected. And Cassio Cunha Lima from Paraíba. And the Vianas, Viana brothers were wiped out in Acre. They had been dominating Acre politics for the last 20 or 25 years. Two former PSDB governors were defeated for the Senate, Beto Hicha Paraná and Marconi Pirillo in Goiás, because of corruption accusations. In the Chamber of Deputies elected all of the 513 seats. 52% turnover. Women increased their representation from 53 to 75, now 15% of the lower house. And one Indian woman from Hondonia was elected deputy. Traditional parties were reduced, as we saw in the Senate, PT, MDB, PSDB, PP, the Democrats, Democratas, and also PR. Other parties increased. As you can see, the PSL had a great increase, PD, PDT, PR, PRB, PSB, PSOL, and SD. The PRB is, uh, has most of the evangelical deputies from the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God. <coughs> 32 deputies who were elected by these smaller parties that didn't make the cutoff may migrate to other parties. President-elect Jair Messias, his middle name is Messias, Messiah, given to him by his mother, begins organizing his new government. The as I said before, the anti-system candidate minus now has to operate and govern within the system. He has uh, vowed to reduce the number of cabinet ministries down from 29 to maybe 15, 16, 17, 18, we're not sure, as did Fernando Collor in 1990. He reduced his the Sarnay cabinet down to 12 ministries. Eliminate ministries and combine some into super ministries. Reduce the number of federal political appointments. Organizing congressional relations should be able to build a fairly strong coalition. And Bolsonaro, as I said, was going to meet tomorrow with 18 governors in Brasilia. The Bolsonaro cabinet has some, some slots already filled. The Casa Civil, economy, defense supposedly has been filled by a general who went to the Supreme Court is now going to defense. Justice, big, big, big appointment. Judge Sergio Moro, who was the main judge in the Lava Jato investigation and put a lot of politicians in jail, he's going to be the ju have an enhanced justice ministry. Justice, CGU, transparency, public security, and COAFI, all under one ministry. Infrastructure, mines and energy, perhaps mines and energy might be left as a separate ministry. Transportation, urban mobility, sanitation, telecommunications. He's already appointed or selected General Osvaldo Fajera. Uh, science, technology, and higher education. The idea is to take higher education out of the Ministry of Education and put it in together with science and technology. And that person is going to be Brazil's only astronaut who went up to the space station. As my nephew said, he's a Nazista because of NASA. <laughs> play on words, play on words, <laughs> play on words. <laughs> so uh, he's going to be the Minister of Science and Technology. He's an uh, uh, an Air Force colonel, a lieutenant colonel. Uh, agriculture has already <laughs> had the first woman be appointed to the cabinet, uh, Deputy Teresa Cristina, who's from Mato Grosso do Sul. She, she's one of the leaders of the Bloco Juralista. Uh, institutional security is General Augusto Heleno, who's one of the generals in Brazil with the, one of the best brains available. And so we're not sure how many, many of the other a cabinet position should be filled by the end of this month. 
Judge Sergio Moro was judge of the 13th Federal Circuit Court in Curitiba. He presided over the Lava Jato corruption investigation, convicted many politicians, not only from the PT, but MDB, PTB, PPPR, et cetera. He convicted Lula in early January of 2018. Bolsonaro, Moro has complete full powers to, con to combat corruption and organized crime. This appointment was criticized by some, especially the PT, because a lot of the PT people were convicted by him. So Moro then said, well, that, means, that must mean that I'm doing a good job. <laughs> Moro's appointment is now being scrutinized by the CNJ, the National Justice Commission as to whether he was playing politics as judge in order to try to get himself appointed to a cabinet position. This, these are the accusations brought to the CNJ. Probably nothing will result there. He resigned his judgeship at age 44. Bolsonaro might appoint him to the Supreme Court in 2020 when the first vacancy appears on the Supreme Court. Moro's temporary substitute is Judge Gabriela Hard, and she convicted José Dracil. So she's, she's hard, she's a hard, hard, Hardline judge. <laughs> now this is Judge Sergio Moro and President-elect Bolsonaro. It's just one thing that uh, Judge Moro and Judge Hart have in common is that they both spoke here at the. That's Rose true. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, Mo Moro's been here, and he's also been to Columbia University and given given presentations but, uh, at, um, at other places here in the U.S. That's true. All, anyone who's important in Brazil comes through the Wilson Center, of course. We hope. <laughs> well, uh, foreign affairs. <laughs> Paulo Guedes unfortunately disdained Argentina, <laughs> said in an interview. Mercosur is a very low priority, and then he answered somewhat uh, flippantly questions from an Argentine journalist. The first foreign visits are going to be to Chile, uh, U.S., and Israel. Bolsonaro, a has made some negative statements about China. China bought up and has bought up many electrical installations in Brazil and is buying up Brazilian land. Bolsonaro visited Taiwan on his Asian trip, and of course that perturbed China considerably. But well, China has issued a cooperation statement saying we hope that Brazil-China relations continue to improve over the next, in the next uh, government. He might transfer the Brazilian embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And of course, this has provoked a lot of negative reactions from the Arabs. Egypt was about ready to receive a delegation headed by the foreign minister uh, early last week. But abruptly, Egypt canceled the, this visit by the foreign, Brazilian foreign minister. Of course, Itamaraty, the diplomat, said, no, no, the visit wasn't canceled. It was just postponed. Also, what will be Bolsonaro's policies vis-a-vis vis -vis Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua? The ex-foreign minister under Lula, Celso Morin, has been preaching against Brazil and the Bolsonaro government in Europe and here the, in the U.S., which is considered somewhat unpatriotic. Amorim is a, a vibrant PT militant. Is Bolso a to answer the question that Paulo raised, is Bolsonaro a threat to Brazilian democracy? Because he was an army captain, with considerable insubordination that got him in the brig several times. And finally, he was, his, his case was decided and he was absolved by the Superior Military Court. Then he resigned his commission and was elected to the Rio City Council and then six terms as federal deputy. Not considered a part of the traditional Brazilian political elite, although he'd been in Congress uh, six, six terms. Because of his defense of the military regime and, and defense of torture while he was deputy and very heated campaign rhetoric, he was described as autocratic, authoritarian, pro-military intervention by the international press, Europe and here in the U.S. Uh, the, these newspapers and press in Europe and the U.S. are somewhat linked to the Brazilian left. There was a study that showed that <coughs> journalists here in the U.S. are mostly liberal Democrat and to the left, rather than being Republican. <laughs> well, okay. Same. <laughs> Who, I, I would agree with that, yes, okay. Bolsonaro has now vo uh, vowed, as, as Paulo mentioned, to adhere to the 1980 Constitution and work with Brazil's institutions, Congress, the judiciary, public prosecutors, and federal police. So really, not at all, I don't think, 
he is a threat to Brazilian democracy, at least not for the time being, but we'll have to wait and see. Challenges for 2019, which some of the previous panels have talked about. Number one, reduce and eliminate the federal public deficit, fiscal deficit. Eliminate waste and extra spending. Try to deal with the fiscal deficits, which are very, very bad, in states like Rio, Rio Grande do Sul, and Minas Gerais. Approve the uh, Social Security reform, which is not going to happen this year. It will be next year. This is the signal that investors are waiting for. When Brazil impeached Dilma Rousseff, investors said, great, you got rid of Dilma. Now, what is this new president going to do? We're going to wait and see. And the signal was the Social Security reform, which didn't happen. And, uh, GDP growth, new job creation. With new investments, this will help. GDP growth and especially new job creation. Tax reform, simpl simplify the tax structure. <coughs> Re reduce or eliminate the Ministry of Labor. It's now going to become part of the economy minister, uh, ministry. Eliminate side payments by new <coughs> labor unions, which is a, a very corrupt practice within the Ministry of Labor. Reduce crime and violence. And then finally, Bolsonaro has said he will try to extradite the Italian terrorist murderer, Cesar Batiste. So these are some of the challenges that face the new government in 2019. Thank you very much. Yes, um, well, just to, before passing it to Chris, there is a challenge, so the main challenge is to get the economy, the Brazilian economy, growing again sustainably and creating jobs. This is probably what uh, will uh, be observed, uh, what people will look into in about six months and decide if they make a, a, a good choice or not. But Chris, please answer all, all our difficult questions. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, it's just a, just say it's a tremendous pleasure to be back here at the Wilson Center. It's, uh, it's always uh, fantastic to participate in these, these high quality events. Uh, uh, Pablo, you're, you're to be commended with all the work you're doing here. Um, uh, so let me try to be um, succinct in, the, in some of my uh, um, views, which is challenging given you know, uh, the fact that this was a unorthodox candidate um, who came out on top, and I think this is going to be an unorthodox administration as well. Uh, you know, if I were to succinctly kind of encapsulate kind of where, you know, where we are right now in terms of our thoughts of the new administration, I would say it's broadly, I think, constructive um, in terms of what we can expect. But we're in an environment of large tail risks, right? <laughs> in terms of both to the downside and to the upside. It's important. Um, so let me kind of um, unpack how I arrive at these conclusions. Um, first, let's start with the good news. What are the things that, um, that we're not worried about? Um, and I would echo, uh, uh, Paulo, your comments and David's comments. I'm not worried about the quality of democracy being at risk in Brazil, um, even independent of of the uh, of the intent of the president-elect that you can get into a debate when you look at what are the conditions by which uh, countries have evolved into a soft authoritarian equilibrium and you know we we have many examples in Turkey um, in in Russia in Venezuela usually it's a president that's elected uh, surfing on pretty benign economic conditions very high approval ratings you use that political capital to overcome institutional uh, hurdles through a referendum, constitutional reform, centralized policy making in the executive office, right? Um, we're not in this environment in Brazil. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're in a very difficult public opinion environment. Uh, this is a, an election marked by deep disenchantment over the quality of public services, voters linking poor public services with corruption. These are very difficult demands to meet. I don't think we're going to head toward an environment with an intense honeymoon period. In fact, I think that we're going to have a short honeymoon period for this, uh, this new administration. And more broadly, Brazil's institutions are pretty broadly consolidated, um, highly decentralized, constitutionally independent judiciary, prosecutor's office, a Congress that impeached the president, a federal system that is fairly decentralized. If there is a crisis, the risk is to Bolsonaro's mandate. It's not to Brazil's democratic institutions. Um, the other thing I'm not worried about is the agenda. 
that's not trivial. Um, and uh, Balu's kind of question on the on the table. Um, you know, we have a, a federal deputy in, in Bolsonaro, uh, you know, who has been in Congress for 28 years. He, his track record isn't particularly encouraging. He voted against the privatization of state-owned enterprises. He, he said that former President Cardoso should be shot for his support uh, on that agenda. He didn't support Tamar's pension reform. Um, he supports salary increases to the public sector. You kind of look at this profile and you say, this looks like a nationalist state interventionist. And then you got this guy, his main economic advisor in Paulo Gadji's liberal trained economist from the University of Chicago. He's saying that you need to privatize all state-owned enterprises, conduct a deep fiscal reform, and is a true liberalizing. And then, then the skeptics are saying, oh, well, who, who should we believe? The guy whose track record, who's this nationalist or this liberal economist? And, and some of the critics are saying, when the first sign of difficulty, he's going to abandon Paulo Gadji's and go back to his roots. Um, I don't buy that narrative. I don't buy that narrative. If you if you speak once you do a little bit more digging, and you um, and you speak with people who are close to the president elect, the picture that emerges is essentially a candidate that had been meeting with economists for about a year and a half or two years uh, over the course of you know his campaign when he uh, announced it four years ago. His son Eduardo Bolsonaro had brought some of this liberal thinking uh, into the mix. Uh, and so you have a very slow conversion of the candidate to a liberal economic policy platform. At one point, the strategic decision was made that, that he was going to campaign on a social conservative platform and a liberal economic agenda on the other. After he made that decision, he brought Paulo Gadges into the mix. In other words, the sequence is very important. It's not that I'm going to get a good economist and then I'll go figure out whether I agree with that agenda or not. No, that's not what happened, right? What, what it suggests to me is that even if Paulo Gadges doesn't stick around, that the agenda is going to stay. The agenda has got a deeper roots than the personality of one economic advisor. That's point number, uh, that's, that's important to appreciate. And number two, many times the, the press talks about the structure of this administration. And when you look at the structure of decision making of the new administration, it's very centralized. You have the president elect, you have his three sons, right, who are in this kind of, you know, circle of advisors. You have the president of the PSL, Gustavo Bebiano. You have the new chief of staff, Democratic legislator, Onyx Loading Zoni. You know, and that's it, right? And then you got two very important s figures that are structuring the government. You got Paulo Gadges on the economic portfolio, and you have General Augusto Eleno on the security and social portfolio. Those two guys are structuring the nominations within the administration. So you have a wing of the military and a wing of the liberal economists. And then the press sometimes says there are two factions. One is state interventionist. The other is liberal, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, market-friendly wing. Who's going to win? And there's, okay. But, you know, that's also a mischaracterization. I think that the view that the military is state interventionist is an antiquated view of the institution. I think that we all have to become better students of the military as an institution in Brazil. We haven't had to study the military for a long time as political scientists. Now we have to go back to understand that. In speaking to the generals, what, the, what you really see is a military that is open to the role of the private sector and regulated sectors of the economy, even though you're going to have a general probably tackling the infrastructure portfolio and Osvaldo Ferreira. You know, I think that you know, what, what I'm hearing is that the, the two sides are speaking to each other. They have a good agenda. There's no major policy divergences. So what that means, I think that we're going to get a good agenda. We're going to get good folks in, in key positions um, on economic decision making. Um, I think it's going to be a focused uh, government on increasing the role of the private sector. It's going to be a free trade oriented administration. The relationship with the U.S. is going to be a very good one. Um, uh, you know, we're even hearing that initiations of a waiver towards medical school to initiate and a free trade agreement with the, United, with the U.S. could be put on the table. Hard to say whether it's going to move forward, but I think, you know, unilateral reduction in tariffs, you know, so I think that the private sector is going to love what they're going to see from the profile, the direction, and the policy orientation of this government, okay? That's the good news. <laughs> what is it that, that we're worried about? Um, uh, we're worried um, about the relationship in Congress and governability, okay? Um, and uh, as I'm sure you've heard in the previous panel, Brazil uh, is facing a major economic challenge, and the problems are fiscal, fiscal, fiscal. You have a primary deficit of 2% of GDP. You need to deliver a primary surplus of 2% of GDP to be able to avoid your net and debt gross levels from continuing to rise. The economic recovery 
depends entirely on the ability of the administration to make progress on tackling this fiscal hole. And the only way you can tackle this fiscal ch uh, uh, challenge is by approving uh, constitutional reform on pension rules. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I would say that we're in a potential fork in the road, okay? Because if the administration is able to get something on pension reform, we could be in a positive, virtuous cycle. Because you are seen as tackling part of the fiscal imbalances, and then you get all this good agenda of, you know, more heavier role for the private sector in oil and gas, logistics infrastructure, free trade, kind of, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, some of this uh, kind of, you know, having um, debureaucratizing, you know, streamlining of licensing, and so on and so forth, right? And you can, and you have a lot of repressed investments that haven't been occurred over the past year because of the election risk. And then, then you can kind of, and we have a lot of companies that are cash rich and they're looking for investments. And, you know, we have, we have offices in Sao Paulo, in Brasilia. We have a number of Brazilian clients and companies in the financial sector. I would say that there's an upside to growth if you're able to get that kind of stability and you tackle the fiscal. If you don't approve pension reform, we're in a world of hurt. Because then the expectations on the financial sector will unwind, the real can go back to 450, the conditions for the recovery start to get stymied, and the government's approval ratings start to drop, and then you have an unorthodox president who's willing to blame institutional actors who get in his way, and then we can get into uh, an environment of, of difficult economic environment and institutional tension, right? Uh, our bet at Eurasia Group is that you get something on pension, right? But the path is narrow, right? Uh, and it's probably going to be very slimmed down. So let me let me kind of unpack the the, the, the concerns um, and the risks um, for this. I, and here I would say, listen, you know, the first thing to recognize is exactly what David um, just highlighted in his presentation, which is we have a president that was elected on a platform of changing the way politics is done. He was elected because he's not seen as a traditional politician. He say he's not going to do politics in the way that Brasilia is, is going to do. He has campaigned on an anti-corruption platform. And what he's saying is that he is not going to distribute cabinet positions in order to be able to have a coalition in Congress, right? That he's going to nominate ministers according to technocratic competence and what he views is the best person for the job. Crazy notion, right? Uh, and... Uh, and, uh, but the problem is, is, is that that violates the covenant of the way of getting things done in Congress. Yeah. Because the grand bargain in Brazilian politics has always been that if you're, you know, you have a presidential democracy, you have 31 parties elected to the lower house. Um, the president's party has 52 seats, but it's only 10% of the seats of the lower house, right? Uh, and so the grand bargain is, listen, I will vote for the agenda of the president, right? Um, but I want something in exchange. I will approve reforms that are unpopular and I pay a price on my constituents, but I want to have access to pork and patronage, government appointments, budgetary amendments. And then the 23,000 appointments. 23,000 appointments, that's a lot, right? <laughs> and then, and then the, the idea is I can, I can pay a price on my votes, but I'll get something in return that will help me get reelected, okay? And, and it's the, to, to grease the wheels of your political machine. So the challenge is how do you get difficult reforms done if you're not going to distribute pork and patronage, all right? We think Bolsonaro will deliver, will distribute something. He will have to give second tier appointments, budgetary amendments, not as if he's not going to play the game at all, but he's not going to give what traditional parties are used to get receiving, all right? Um, and so that's challenge number, number one. Uh, challenge number two is that we've had a tsunami in Brasilia. Half of the lower house didn't get elected, as they would give you the numbers. Uh, very low, r low rate of reelection in the Senate. Um, and the bad news is you look at the composition of those who lost their seats versus the composition of those who kept their seats. And what we find is the legislators who supported President Michel Temer's difficult fiscal and economic reforms lost their seats in a greater proportion to the ones who voted against the measures. When you look at the votes on the cap on spending, which is a constitutional cap on spending, uh, we did that analysis of the Eurasia Group. Those who supported the cap on spending uh, lost their seats uh, by 50%, and those who voted against it kept their seats. So they had a 70% 70 70 success of re-election. When you look in the, in the Special Committee on Pension Reform, those who voted in favor of Temer's pension reform, uh, out of the 17 who voted in favor, only four won their seats. 
so a rate of renewal of uh, close to 25 percent. And those who voted against it, uh, you know, 70 um, percent of them, 75 uh, percent of them kept their mandate. Same numbers, a little bit smaller on the on, on labor reform. It, maybe you know one of the hypotheses is okay. Well, if you voted for these difficult reforms, you paid a price in the ballot box. Maybe another hypothesis is no, 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 no. It's that senior traditional established politicians generally support reforms, and and uh, and they paid a price because they were seen as part of the establishment. Maybe. Maybe it's because they're seen as, uh, you know, closer to Temer, maybe. It doesn't matter the reason, though. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that reformists lost their seats in a greater proportion than those who didn't support the reforms. And then you look at those who are coming in. Okay, who are these guys? Right? <laughs> and then, and, you know, it's harder, but you know, what we're finding is that these are socially conservative legislators tied to the, to the Evangelical Caucus, tied to the Security Caucus, they are heavily play a role on social media to be able to to to, to get known in the campaign. Rural, rural caucus. So, sorry. Rural, rural caucus. A rural, rural um, agricultural caucus. So these are kind of let's say socially more conservative, but not necessarily more market friendly, right? Um, and so you know, so again, you so you have a challenge of not fragmented Congress. Um, you're not going to distribute the benesses to generate discipline and a profile of Congress that doesn't look as reformist. So how in the heck are you going to be able to get a constitutional coalition to get fiscal reforms done? What the government is talking about and, and, and the plan of Bolsonaro is that they're going to negotiate with these legislative caucuses. They're going to negotiate with the agricultural caucus, with the, with the evangelical caucus, with the security caucus. These are loose agglomerations of legislators um, that sometimes range anywhere from 100 to 150 uh, uh, deputies each. And you look at the profile of the nominations, the, you know, the, the new minister of agriculture, she came from the agricultural caucus. The nomination yesterday from the health ministry came from the health caucus. So it looks like Bolsonaro say, I'm not going to negotiate with parties. I'm going to negotiate with these loose agglomerations of interest. I don't think that's going to work. These, these caucuses don't have a mechanism of disciplining their rank and file. They're effective mechanism of coordinating the vote on issues specific to their caucuses. But they can't kind of say, oh, I, I received something in the agriculture side, so you deliver me votes on the pension. There's no mechanism of enforcement. When you negotiate with party leaders, party leaders have a mechanism of enforcement because they say, I strike a deal with the executive, and if my rank and file doesn't vote according to the deal, I'm not going to give you a budget or, or, or a committee appointment. I'm not going to give you access to the, to the official party and electoral fund. You have tools to be able to discipline. These caucuses don't. They only meet infrequently. And they're only effective to coordinate on the issue. So I think that's a failed strategy. Right? Um, so, and you know, you add to the fact that this is going to be a very short honeymoon period. What do I think the best shot of this government is? You got to go for something very quick, and you got to go for something that you can easily sell to the public. Because if you don't have the public's support behind the proposal, right, and you don't do this very quick, you're in big trouble. Because you're, the honeymoon is going to be short, your pool ratings are going to start to climb, and you have to be able to spin this and sell this to the public so that legislators think that this reform is on the public opinion side. Right? The good news is the, the, the strategy in the economic team that we're hearing is an effective one. I think that they're, going, they're not going for something big and something ambitious. And I think that the worst sign that we could get is let's ha this to have an aggressive fiscal reform. Let's try to have an ambitious proposal of earnestly tackling the fiscal challenges. Because if they start with that, they're going to waste time. They're going to bring this to vote in the second half of the year when your, your approval rating is starting to drop, and you're not going to have loyalty in the Congress, and then the risk of not approving anything is higher. The only shot this government has is to go small, communicate it effectively, and bring this to a vote pretty darn quickly. Right? So it's not going to be a, a one-all solution to the fiscal challenge, but if you can just get something done, then this kind of positive, virtuous cycle can happen. We're betting on that, but I'll tell you, I'm pretty darn worried that they'll fall flat on their face. Uh, you know, I think that there is a real risk of that happening. Um, and then if we're in that world, then, of course, you know, the economic recovery doesn't happen, the institutional tensions can come, and then we have a, we're in a different, we're in a vessel. So I think it is a, you know, I'll just conclude here and say, um, you know, that, the, that the, the real, let's say, narrative that I think the media should be covering of this government isn't the threat to democracy is, how can this great new experiment of governing without distributing poor compassion actually work in this environment? Thank you very much. Right. Oh, thank you all for some very, 
fascinating comments. I'm sure we're going to have some questions, so I just want to open it up. Yes, right here in front. Yeah. Um, I'm very encouraged by your vision of a bright future for Brazil. I just want to say, inshallah, <laughs> let's hope that it really takes place, um, as you say. But I'm a bit uh, puzzled by the, uh, your assessment of the relevance of, uh, of the pension reform for the sustainability of all the other reforms and, and for Brazil. I, I have the feeling that this is what we thought uh, sometimes in 2016 when the government was expected to pass a pension reform and then pass the expenditure cap, justifying it as a tool that would help <laughs> pass the pension reform. And then in 2017 again, and now you know in 2018 uh, the reform was not passed, and somehow the markets were not spooked by that. And why do you think that this is a deal breaker now for the future? Uh, listen, that's that's a great that's a great and very important question. And um, you know I've been doing kind of political risk consulting, and we work with financial markets. Uh, I've been in my entire career, and I'm always astounded how the goalposts of what needs to be delivered is driven primarily by the external backdrop, right? So what happened when Temer came into office, you're exactly right. They said, uh, you know, he can deliver a cap on spending, but if he doesn't deliver a pension reform, then it's all to not because we're headed towards an uncertain election without a fiscal anchor. And then, you know, the government was two weeks away from approving pension reform. JBS scandal came. The government almost fell. They didn't deliver it, and markets were like, eh, we can wait until after the election, right? And, and the backdrop, of course, was is that, you know, we had an environment where concerns of the Federal Reserve raising interest rates abated. We had benign growth in U.S. We had, you know, let's say, uh, benign uh, liquidity. And so you had a more benign environment for emerging markets. And then in that context, Brazil and other EMs didn't have to deliver as much, right? Um, listen, could we have a a benign global backdrop in which you can get away with not delivering pension reform and similar to what happened um, you know, under the Temer administration? Yes, right? Um, but I would say that the distribution of risks on the, on the global backdrop is actually getting worse rather than getting better. You know, we have a, you know, growing concerns of a trade conflict with U.S. and China. Our own house view at Eurasia Group is that this is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, we're probably in a in a period of normalization of interest rates with the Federal Reserve. Um, so I think that, um, you know, and also the, the longer that you delay this adjustment, right, the more vulnerable the economy gets. And we can see what happened with Argentina and Turkey, that you kind of delay adjustments and you eventually pay a price, right, in terms of from a, a crisis of confidence. The benefit in Brazil is that you have domestic debt rather than external debt, so your external financing needs aren't as large. You know, I, I would say, yes, it's possible, right, but um, but I think that the, you know, unless things get better on the global backdrop, right, <laughs> I think that there will be a lot of frustration uh, from market participants on not delivering something next year, right? And, uh, and if we don't deliver anything next year in pension reform, what I'm hearing from our clients is that the real could go from 370 to 450, the conditions for the recovery could be undermined. Um, you know, that's it's not a disastrous, calamitous scenario, but it's a very difficult scenario, right? So, I mean, I, I, I take your point that you got to take with a skepticism the if you don't do this, then the world will fall apart that we hear in financial markets. Those, those things shift, it, you know, and it could also get worse, right? Right now, I think that if he delivers just a very modest pension reform, which is get Temer's proposal in the plenary lower house, water down a little bit, I think markets are going to celebrate. But if the global backdrop gets worse, then maybe the requisite of what they have to deliver is more, right? Remember I told you there's a 4% of GDP gap, right? The Temer's proposal in the lower house right now only generates a savings of 1.2% of GDP, you know? So in other words, you still have much more to do, right? So in other words, even if you deliver some pension reform and it's a watered-down version, that doesn't do the trick, right? So, Well, uh, our whole pension system problem is like a tsunami. The deficit is just increasing tremendously every year. And so as, as after, after the Wall Street blowout in 2008, many of the European countries were forced to do some budget adjustments and fiscal adjustment. The first thing they adjusted was, was uh, their pension systems to increase the years of service and increase uh, minimum age to retire. 
Uh, even if, as, as Chris says, Bolsonaro is able to produce a more or less uh, pension reform, not a strong pension reform, uh, this is a very important signal or sign to investors, not only domestic investors, but international investors. And new investments, especially with innovation, are extremely important for our economy to create new jobs and reduce unemployment. And so the pension reform uh, is a very, very important thing to, to approve in the first semester. Now, uh, Paulo Guedes, our, our economy minister, has said, in the long run, we're going to try to approve a capitalization plan, which was approved with, by the Chicago boys in, in Chile, which means that all of the new people coming into the Social Security system, their contributions will be capitalized. Each one will have their capitalization account. And so when you retire, your benefits would have been capitalized by this capitalization system, maybe 30, 40 years from now. So his idea is to approve this capitalization scheme, which doesn't affect the current system, but would affect the, the system in the next 20, 30, 40 years. But it, it is the, the reform that has to be addressed. Well, the other, the other point is that Tamer backed, backed away from his reform because he decreed a intervention into the state of Rio. And the Constitution says that when you have an intervention into any state, you can't approve any constitutional amendments. So couldn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, just to stay on the, the you know, uh, this is now the capitalization program that Gaddis proposed. This is for the country of the future. Exactly. Remember, we are the country of the future. So in the future, we will do that. <laughs> Uh, but right now, <laughs> what we need to do <laughs> is what you were saying. <laughs> and <laughs> let's see. And this will depend on, I think, Bolsonaro will be measured. We will see Bolsonaro in action. Because this is a function of presidential leadership. You have to lead and you have to go to Congress and convince your former peers that this is good for the country you are going to do. And as Bolsonaro has surprised uh, Brazil, his capacity to mobilize the electorate. <laughs> well, let's hope that he surprises Brazil again, showing a political capacity to leadership. Push leadership he, he, may, he may use social media and social networks to do that, mm -hmm. yeah. which he very adaptly, <laughs> adequately used to get elected. I think th th I follow what you, what you just said is key, because if you're not using your traditional tools of disciplining of pork and patronage, mm -hmm. right, it means that public opinion is going to matter a heck of a lot more. This is going to be a Congress that's going to be much more dependent upon how they perceive debates on social media and how this impacts their mandate. Even those who kept their seats, they're much worried about keeping their seats given that half of their colleagues lost their seats, right, in the lower house. Yeah. So Bolsonaro has got to grab the bull by the horns and he's got to defend pension reform and convince legislators that doing a pension reform is equivalent and tantamount to combating the privileges of the public sector elite. If he doesn't get the public anger against politicians on the side of pension reform, then he has a weaker leg to stand on. Sure, sure, sure. You know, and so, uh, you know, I, again, I, I think he'll do a version of that, but you know, he needs to take the lead on the communication strategy, and he has to have a very basic proposal and not do the capitalization. There, there are economists within his team that want him to go bold. They say that, listen, this is the one opportunity. Well you, you gotta, you know, you're at the beginning of the mandate. You have one shot of doing fiscal reform. So let's do a fiscal reform that earnestly tackles the challenges and let's have a capitalized system, more aggressive cuts on, the, on, on spending over the next 10 years. And, you know, they have a, a expected savings of about 1.2, 1.3 trillion. There's a proposal by Arminio Faraga and, and Paulo Tafner that was presented to the economic team. I'll tell you, if they go down that path, I, I get worried. <laughs> because I don't see room for that. I think that the best shot is to go small and go quick. A little bit, right. <laughs> Other questions here in the middle? We can hear you. Go okay. ahead.
right to take Well, that. we've had some uh, some examples of that right now in, in, the, in the toward the end of Tamron's administration. We have all of the uh, environmental protection people who are going after the loggers and other uh, people breaking the law and cutting down the Amazon. And they have been attacked physically with guns and also burning their vehicles as well and have had to request the intervention of the armed forces and the national security force. So already in Temer's administration there are strong challenges from the, the, those doing the, the burning and the cutting down of the Amazon against the, the, the environmental protection people. Whether, uh, whether Bolsonaro will continue that support for these people with the national security force and the armed force, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I, I expect that he will, but that's my own personal opinion. What, what I would say is just that um, I think that the, if you're talking about the approving, for you to be able to um, do away with kind of these environmental, uh, say, areas that are protected, you know, by Brazil's legislation, and a lot of this has to do with indigenous areas mm -hmm. uh, that are protected by the Constitution, right? It's very hard to imagine that we're going to have changes in legislation that will do away with the large swaths of the Amazon that are protected legally, right? Uh, I think that um, he's not going to, he wouldn't have a majority to be able to do those type of things in Congress. So I think that uh, it's very hard for him by executive decree mm -hmm. to engage in the deforestation and the doomsday scenarios that we're seeing a little bit in the press. The issue, though, is if you have an administration that isn't committed to environmental protection, you don't have funding of the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. You don't have as much enforcement on, on, uh, on some of these areas. So can we have the Environmental Protection Agency and Obama not getting as much funding and, and backing to be able to enforce what's in the legislation? Yes, I think that, that could happen, right? We're already seeing this under Temer to a certain degree. But I would say it's more of a slow burn, not to, no pun intended, um, you know, it, than a than a kind of radical undoing of the of the of the legal protections that we're That's seeing on the environmental side. Uh, just two thoughts on that one. Uh, this is going to happen not only with the pr Brazilians meeting and deciding what to do. Brazil makes certain commitments internationally, uh, or conventions. There are uh, 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 so uh, there's pressure, and there are especially in Europe the threat of a reply of sanctions depending on how Brazil goes about. If Brazil decides not to fulfill its own commitment that it freely made, approved by Congress. I'm thinking about the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, for instance, Bolsonaro initially decided that we are going to leave the Paris Agreement. Not anymore. Uh, he decided that, and this is apparently a harder decision of moving the Brazilian embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Well, that's under debate because there is seven billion dollars of exports of meat or agro uh, industrial product uh, to Arab and Islamic countries, and this would suffer. So there is the international context is important. In the internal context, I and I have been following this. Uh, I think uh, the part of the what we call the environmental community, including scientists in Brazil, highly respected scientists in uh, uh, the public sector. I believe Embrapa will play a role in this because Embrapa is connected to the most advanced uh, type of thinking as of agriculture, which requires uh, environmental preservation. Is the science-based <laughs> agriculture that is very important. That Geraldo mentioned, and I believe that uh, uh, the military can play a positive role in this. Remember one thing: the people in Brazil that are really connected to indigenous communities, that are really there, that are taking care of people, are the military. So uh, it's not that oh, people want to open the Amazon and the military, let's burn it. No, it doesn't work like that. I think it will be an opportunity to engage internally in Brazil in society in a very important discussion because this, this issue has been evolved in Brazil in a positive way. I covered the Rio 92 uh, Earth Conference 
And at that time, Brazil was in the Middle Ages regarding this issue. Brazil today is up to the task, and actually there was just an exchange I saw on Twitter between the M M ambassador to from Norway and uh, someone, and Lorenzoni. Lorenzoni. Uh, and, uh, you know, because Lorenzoni tweeted something about uh, you know, the, the Amazon fund, etc., and the ambassador. Oh, yeah, the largest use in the Amazon fund. Yes, and, uh, well, there is, a, there, will be, there, is going, there is going to be lots of communication in here, and we know, because we are close to some of the people in the agricultural community, producers, that are we're environmentally responsible and know what needs to do and what cannot happen because it would be to the detriment of Brazilian exports of agricultural products. Yeah, there's, there's uh, very, very important points, Paulo, and I would just kind of just piggyback a little bit on your comments and just say that, you know, what's unfortunate about such a polarized environment is that the quality of the debate in the press is very poor, right? So it's like, Oh, we have a very conservative kind of uh, neo-fascist president who wants to burn down the Amazon because he doesn't care about environmental protection. But there is an agenda of modernizing Brazil's environmental licensing laws, which is important, right? Because the, there is a point of the agriculturalists that they have, is that for you to be able to have, to obtain environmental licenses, it's, the bureaucracy is tremendous, you have uh, risk-averse, environmental agents to be able to sign their name for environmental licenses for infrastructure projects or even for agriculture projects. So, so there is a pathway to modernize the environmental legislation that can expedite the ability to conduct investments, but not detriment, not a detriment to, to uh, keeping kind of environmental preserves. And you, you look at some of the, the agricultural producers, they say, listen, we, we don't need to cut down virgin rainforest. There's a lot of arable land to be able to cultivate that does not have to get into the rainforest. And so, so the problem is, you know, how do you have a government that can actually, there's a, there's a good and legitimate agenda, but it'll be characterized as anti-environment. Not, not to say that Bolsonaro doesn't, you know, I don't think his weights are maybe are appropriately <laughs> distributed in terms of protecting environmental, but I think that there, there, is a, there is an important agenda to be there. So there's a point from the agricultural lobby that we, we can't ignore entirely. Uh, Ken, it's in the middle. Wait for the mic. It's right behind you. Uh, Kent Hughes here, a public policy fellow here, and a sort of a, a, a junior assistant to Paolo on some occasions. <laughs> that I look at this wonderful chart of the Brazilian legislature. It looks like a multicolored rainbow, but no assurance of a pot of gold. The, I remember the military government attempted to create a more European or more North American style political structure. Is there any chance for a kind of political consolidation in Brazil? And if that took place, might that ease the problem of uh, Bolsonaro, any future president? Well, yeah, the, w one of the problems that's described, and you look at your, your rainbow, is that there are so many parties in Congress. As I said, and you mentioned, 31 parties in the lower house. However, seven or eight of those parties may disappear because we have a a new clause that was passed last year, which is a performance clause that says if your party did not get 1.5 percent of the national valid vote, your party doesn't receive any money from the party fund and doesn't have any access to free campaign time on television. No money, no TV, that will kill almost any party. So a lot of those parties are now looking at mergers with other larger parties and their deputies will probably transfer and migrate to other parties. Then. As of 2020, for the 2022 general elections, the, the, the reform passed last year says, okay, for electing deputies, no more political coalitions, no election coalitions to elect deputies. We have maybe 10 or 12 or 15 parties that can only elect one deputy because they participate in coalitions. So that's gonna be another reform that will further reduce the number of parties in, in the lower house. Uh, another reform possible would be to, we have a proportional, a proportional representation system. Lots of countries have PR, but ours is the worst possible because we, it doesn't, in, in Europe, you vote for the party and that's it. You vote for the party list. 
In Brazil, there's a party list of candidates, but you can make an individual vote, a 95% vote for an individual candidate. And then you have very, very, uh, very, very weak linkages between the electorate and the elected deputy. Six months later, no one can remember who they voted for. So another reform might be close the party list and vote only for, for the party and not for the individual candidate. Other questions? <laughs> Over here in front. Hi, uh, Brian Berg with uh, AEI. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to not forget, uh, Chris mentioned a sort of antiquated um, idea or view of what the Brazilian military is all about. Um, there was a good report done by Luis Bittencourt and Florida International University Press like a week ago or two weeks ago on Brazilian military culture. So good report to review. Um, so up-to-date well information. Yeah. So um, my question concerns the ability or the, the, the future trajectory of the U.S.-Brazil relationship, um, particularly with respect to uh, the Brazilian Foreign Ministry, Ita Marachi. Um, from my experience working with them at the State Department, they can sometimes be a difficult partner uh, for the U.S. And Bolsonaro has talked about sort of um, rhetorical flashes like ferreting out particular ideological biases within the within the ministry. But I think what he, you know, what what's actually there besides those rhetorical flashes is that you know there are vested interests that might work against any sort of bettering of the of the relationship between the U.S. and Brazil. So wondering if you have any comments on um, how he will either work with Itamarachi or work around them or work to change the culture there, um, any sort of roadblocks that you foresee uh, the foreign ministry putting up with the caveat, of course, that we don't have a name yet. For we don't have a minister yet. And there are a lot of speculations of who that might be. But most of the speculations say it will, it will be a professional diplomat from within the foreign ministry. But Bolsonaro said quite, quite hard we will no longer have any ideological biases in our foreign relations, neither right or left. And we won't have any ideological uh, uh, biases within our foreign trade either. Now, whether that's going to <coughs> make Brazil-U.S. relations any better, we'll have to wait and see uh, who the new minister is going to be and who, who the, the secretaries of various areas within Itamarachi, Itamarachi are going to be. Probably there will be an improvement uh, with U.S.-Brazil relations, I, w I would assume, but not totally, let's say. Yeah. Let me add something, and after this I have to run because I have to give an interview here on this floor, right? Yeah, yeah. the Hour TV studio. But and, and thank you very much for being here. On this question, uh, first, there is a name that is being speculated about, uh, José Alfredo Graça Lima, who is a uh, very experienced Brazilian diplomat, uh, a great, great person, uh, who would very well uh, implement a presidentially mandated direction. Uh, I think part of this, as we can sense, and from exchanges of messages and other things, is that the Brazil-U.S. relationship will become important again for Brazil and for the United States. Uh, presidential leadership counts. It matters. Uh, in the six years where two ideologically and stylistically compatible presidents of Brazil and the United States coincided in power, that was during the Clinton Cardozo. There were some important initiatives. One of them, you, you hear about Alcantara, the agreement to launch communication satellites, American satellites uh, from uh, the Alcantara base. At that time, was on Ukrainian, I think, rockets, missiles. 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 Rocket. Well, that was negotiated by the two presidents, the two administrations, and then shelved by the administration of President Lula. It never left the Brazilian side of the agenda. Why? Because it's absolutely sensible. It may come back. I think there will be other things happen to, 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 to happen there. But I think that there is a different disposition 
uh, that could be translated into uh, actual achievements. The two presidents seem to have, on the part of President Trump, we know he is, uh, and there is actually a guidance from, as I understand, guidance uh, from Washington to U.S. embassies around the world saying focus on results, focus more on results, less on process. Uh, that would be a challenge for Brazilian diplomacy that loves process, uh, but I think that would coincide with the instinct of Bolsonaro. Let's focus on results. I, you know, I have an article going that I hope to, to <laughs> send to there tomorrow, the paper in Brazil. I think I see the Embraer Boeing deal. But that is a deal. It does it's done. It's <laughs> negotiated ready and mm -hmm. ready ready to sign. It makes absolute sense. It has the support of the Brazilian Air Force. And uh, well it needs leadership, it needs action. Yeah. Let's see how that goes and uh, obviously we know all the pitfalls, we know all where the resistances could come from, mm -hmm. but uh, well, presidents are there to lead and are here to lead. Let's yeah. see if they are capable, able, able. Exer able to exercise in that leadership yeah. and resolve this, this unrealized love affair between Brazil and the United States that existed for what, since the end of Second World War. <laughs> and Paulo, well, I think why, you've been summoned. Why is the Alcantara base so important? Why does the U.S. want to use this? Way? Because it's so close to the equator. The closer the, the launch site is to the equator, the heavier payload you can produce for the same thrust. That's why the Russians are so, their base is so far north of the equator, they have to have huge rockets to la launch their things into space. Even Cape Kennedy is not not as much as farther away from the equator than Alcantara. Alcantara is just below the equator, so Alcantara is a very important launching site because of this uh, proximity to the equator. I think we have time for one more question, if we have any. Up here, front. Can I just ask about um, reputational risk of thing based on? things that Bolsonaro has said or reported to said and sort of how he's perceived. Are we hearing anything, uh, how that might affect um, commerce, economics, commerce here from the private sector, or do they feel that it doesn't matter to them as long as the economy is improving? Yeah, well, good question. I mean, I w what I would say is um, the fact that the coverage of this administration and president-elect has been so poor um, of uh, of being, you know, a threat to democracy, of kind of uh, of uh, not not you know, let's say uh, harsh language, um, you know, against minorities. Uh, certainly didn't do particularly well with the female vote uh, in the election. So, are there some companies in the private sector who are a bit concerned about being associated with this administration or? We get a little bit of that, but to be honest, um, I don't think it's going to be a major impediment from a FDI and investments. Um, you know, multinational corporations are used to dealing with with uh, with governments and countries of various different political colors and stripes. And uh, and ultimately, if in fact, you know, we're correct that this is not really a threat to democracy, that there is a lot of hyperbole in some of this language and coverage, and and if you have a president that's working within kind of the rules of the game and the more he participates in international events, I think uh, some of that hyperbole will start to die down. Not to say that we're not going to be in a polarized environment in Brazil. I think it will. I don't think Bolsonaro is going to tame his rhetoric tremendously. Uh, he, he was successful um, in playing to this anger. I don't think he's going to change entirely. Um, so things like uh, if Folha de São Paulo, a newspaper in Brazil, criticizes him, he says, well, I'm not going to give any publicity to a, 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 a newspaper that engages in fake news, right? He'll he'll use that rhetoric, and which is very similar to what we're seeing in the United States. <laughs> Look what happened with the uh, with uh, with, uh, with, C with CNN, right? Okay. Just uh, what Trump did here this last week, right? Um, so I think we're going to get that kind of colorful rhetoric, um, but I don't think it's going to be to the point of meaningfully impacting um, investments and commerce and growth. If we look at the the survey research done by the uh, Data Foya, and also by Boapi. Early on in the first round campaign, they broke they broke down their 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 interviews by by sectors, and at that point 
let's say in late August, early September, Bolsonaro was, was not doing that well among women voters. But toward the end of the first round, right. these two surveys, Ibuapi and Datafoy, showed that he was winning more support from women than Adaji was. And so the women came around, <laughs> mostly because of the, the problems that, that he was, he was uh, addressing, anti-Lula, anti-PT, and especially anti-political system. And the, the women, he then had a majority of, of support from women. Among the religions, the only religious group which was not very favorable to Bolsonaro were what we call the spiritualists, the Kardec spiritualists, who are, who are quite a large religious group in Brazil. Yes. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming and thank our wonderful panelists as well uh, for sharing their insight. <laughs> And I'm sure we'll be doing more events in the future, so stay tuned. <laughs>